So this morning in James chapter five, we're going to see three things. We're going to see James talk about possessions, patience, and prayers. So let's take a look at this section about possessions and earthly riches. Take a look at chapter five, verses one through three. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. What a fun, welcoming, right word for Sunday morning, huh? All right. It's no wonder people don't like teaching through the whole council of scripture verse by verse, because this is an offensive word to some people. <laughs> but it's funny, in this section, remember, we're talking about the kind of behavior where possessions begin to possess you. See, this is important, and I have to note this before we even start breaking down the verses, because there were many rich people in the Bible that were good people, <laughs> that belong to the Lord, that follow the Lord. And today in his church, the local church and globally, there are people that love the Lord, that have been blessed and stewarded with good things, earthly things, but that they would use them rightly. And see, in this section though, we're talking about you rich, you need to weep and how it's talking about this word rich, plusias, it is wealthy and abounding in material resources, and it's a rebuke, not just against those that have things, but those that love their things in an unhealthy way. You see, 1 Timothy 6.10, it says that, that the root of all evil, right? The love of money is a root of all evil. All kinds of evil come out of that. And many have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They chase after things that could be good things. But the people take good things, they make them God things, and it becomes idolatry. <laughs> it becomes arrogant and boastful as you trust in these things. And this is why James says, if you're trusting in these things, you're chasing these things, you believe that you're going to find peace and fulfillment in riches, earthly riches, he says, man, you should weep and howl because of the miseries that are going to come upon you. <laughs> See that word miseries here, you could translate this as calamity. <laughs> man, haven't we all been guilty of saying, man, if I just got a little more money, if I had money, that would bring me the peace that I need right now. <laughs> if I just had a little more provision, man, then I would be fulfilled. I would have peace. But man, if you're seeking provision rather than the provider, <laughs> that's when it becomes problematic. Amen. Amen. And see, this whole section is coming off that section of James 4. It talked about saying, like, don't go about saying, oh, I'm going to go here, there, and here, and make all this money. I have all these plans. I'm so strong. I'm so great. Man, that's boasting. That's arrogance. You should say, according to James 4, if the Lord wills, then I'll do this, that, or the other. And see, in this case, it's like there's no regard for God. It's like, you know who my God is? It's me and my money. These things are going to be what bless me, what take care of me. And he says, man, there's misery coming upon you for these things. And see, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 19, 23 to 24. He said, I say to you that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I'd say Jesus says that's difficult when you start getting money. You start getting possessions. Praise the Lord if you can handle those things and handle them well as a good steward. That's a blessed thing to be able to do that. But I will tell you, living in America, in a materialistic culture, in a consumer culture, it's always about getting, gaining, hoarding. These are the things that are going to make me happy. And Jesus says, man, when you start to take things in like that, it's hard to receive the gospel because you think you're above its need. You think that you have everything that you need. And see, you may have met people like this. You may be someone like this, where you say, look, it, that's great that that poor person over there, that wicked wretch needs the gospel. But look at me, I'm doing great. I've got my health, I've got my house, I've got my kids, I've got my wife, I've got my whole thing set up here. Man, it's hard to acknowledge that you need Jesus Christ in those situations, Amen. 
We have to humbly say, man, I don't have all of the things that I need. I need to come and trust in Jesus. And in verse two, he says, those riches that you're trusting in, he says, first of all, they're corrupted, they're moth-eaten, and they're corroded. <laughs> gold and silver, have you heard everyone tell you, buy gold right now. Gold is the thing. You're going to need gold when everything crashes and everything bumps. Yeah, have fun eating gold when there's no food, right? Everyone says, gold is the thing. I'm not saying don't go get gold if you're into that, whatever. But do you understand there's already a form of judgment that is upon gold as it corrodes? It shows, do you really think this thing is going to preserve you? You're, the, the garments that you're chasing to keep, they get eaten by moths. He says, all of these things you run after, they're corrupted and they're corroded. They rust over. Man, think about the last time you thought, this is going to be the possession that brings me peace and fulfillment. <laughs> Did it do so? You're like, yeah, for two days. <laughs> Then the next thing came. It was like, oh man, I need the accessory that goes with the thing that I just got. Now I have to get this thing. It's funny. I watch my boys do this. My boys are into like Star Wars action figures. They're like, I have the Boba Fett, but I need the rocket pack that goes with Boba Fett now. And I'm like, I don't have the money to get the whole universe of Star Wars for you. <laughs> Enjoy this guy for a day. Please, please give me some time here, dude. Right? But then it's funny because it speaks to my heart. Oh man, I do that all the time. <laughs> Oh, Lord, just give me this thing, Lord. This will be the thing. If you can bring me this thing, we can achieve this thing. And then you achieve it, and you know what you do? You're like, that's not good enough. I need this next thing. All the time, I need something else. And it's like, man, the Lord is faithful to give you what you need if you seek his will. <laughs> Trust him in everything, and don't build up kingdoms here in the sake that you're trusting in them. Praise the Lord if you're a good steward and you can invest well and you can have things. Let me be clear. This is not a message against like, you have to be poor to be a Christian. <laughs> too many people have stressed that too far. Trust me, you can be poor and love money in a really unhealthy way. How many people that are poor say, if I just had money, that'll be my savior. No, you need God. <laughs> you need the Lord Jesus. It's a threat and a, 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 a potential danger to everyone, whether you're poor or rich. But what this is saying is don't hoard up riches here and think that's what's going to save you. That's what's going to make you good. Those things are going to corrode. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 20, he said, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, just like James is talking about, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. <laughs> Can someone steal your God? <laughs> That's scary if you can say, uh-oh. <laughs> I trust in things. If my job went away tomorrow, if my resume has a big old gap in it and I can't get hireable, am I going to be, oh, am I trusting the wrong things? <laughs> man, if the stock market crashed tomorrow, <laughs> man, what are the things we're trusting in? You know what? When you trust in Jesus Christ, no one can steal your God from you. <laughs> no one can take your God. And it's beautiful because not only does Jesus Christ justify you with the work of the cross, he then sanctifies you with his spirit. And then out of that love, he guides you into glorification where someday you will receive the riches that do not fade away. <laughs> what business do we have being in such a relationship with the creator of the universe? Man, what a blessing that he calls us into these things that we would live accordingly. Look at verses four through six. It says, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sebioth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. And see what this is saying, it's giving us more context. This isn't just about riches. It's about, first of all, trusting in riches. And then in this section, it's the despicable methods that wicked men use to gain riches. You see, what this is saying is there's conduct, problematic conduct of doing things like holding back the wages of the people that mowed your field, it says, and you've committed fraud. Now, I know no one commits fraud in these days. This is not a word that affects us, right? <laughs> this is such a timely thing, right? It's a timeless thing. The heart of man is wicked. It's evil, according to Jeremiah 16, 9. 
And what we do is we see things we want, we see things that we desire, and we will do anything to get them. And in this case, it says, man, these men that would own the fields, they would hire someone, they'd agree with them, say, hey, I'm going to pay you so much. And then they'd do the job and they wouldn't pay them. <laughs> they'd hold it back because they were greedy. They got what they wanted. They commit this fraud. Their greedy heart attitude because they're lovers of money is so blatantly apparent in their conduct. And see, James, we talked about, he's writing to a, the early church that was a lot of Jewish converts. They came from Jew, that Jewish background into a full trust in Jesus Christ, and they would know. I mean, how many of you guys are reading through like Deuteronomy or Leviticus right now, right? We're doing the, and the, if you're reading through the Bible on a year plan, you're probably in those books. If not, you'll be there soon. But the reality is in those books, there's all kinds of things where the Lord says things like Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15. He says, if you hire someone, don't oppress them. <laughs> If you hire someone, you agree to pay them something, pay them what you've told them you'll pay them. Have integrity. But see, the reality is people in their selfishness, they say, I don't want to obey the word of God because I'd rather trust myself, steal, rob, and keep, and hoard, and this is where I'm going to trust. Well, it says, don't do these things. And it says in verse 4, the cries of the reapers, those that went out and did these things, that took care of the field, that held the harvest and hand, handled the harvest, it says those cries have reached the Lord of Sabaoth. Now notice, this is not the word Sabbath here. This is a word that in the Hebrew, it means host. The God of hosts, the Lord of hosts. You know what host is? The Lord of hosts is a title that gets used in the Bible to talk about the armies of God that he can send out at any time. That man, at any point, if he decides it's time for vengeance, remember, vengeance belongs to the Lord, amen? He has the power, the ability, and a plan to make things right. And those that have gone against what is right, those that have sinned, that have transgressed, and those outside that blatantly reject the things of God, he says, man, the cries have reached the Lord, and it sounds a little bit to me. Reminds me of Genesis 4.10. When you remember Cain had murdered Abel, and it says, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Sometimes we think, this mic is hot, sorry. Sometimes we think that we're getting away with things because God hasn't brought the consequences to them. Sometimes we think that the world is getting away with things because God has not brought the consequences yet. Can I tell you that the Lord is seeing and hearing everything? That every idle word of man will be brought into judgment according to Jesus Christ. You might right now be so frustrated with the things like fraud that are happening around you, with being treated poorly at your workplace, <laughs> by being treated poorly by others and going, man, I got to do something about this. Let me tell you what the Lord says here. Man, there's going to be a day where all things are going to be judged and made right. Now, to some of you, now I know there's still an error where we fear the Lord. There's a reverence and that scares us to say out loud. But for those of us that trust in Jesus Christ, where we think about the fact that, man, we've been, sometimes been persecuted for righteousness sake, as Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, where you're falsely persecuted for the name of Jesus. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. But you need to know that judgment will come. Justice will be served. And I don't know about you guys. I don't want justice on my life. I want grace in my life. <laughs> but there's a reality that those that reject and resist the grace of God and their proud arrogance, there is going to be a day where they've rejected the grace that comes through the gospel of Jesus, they're going to have to stand before the judge and it's going to be justice. I don't want to be in that judgment. <laughs> we see this in the great white throne judgment. That is not the judgment for believers. The Bema seat is the judgment for believers in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. That's where we come in because we've been saved by grace through faith. The Lord rewards in his goodness the things that we did in his unto his kingdom and unto his name. But when you reject Jesus Christ, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow before his judgment seat. And it's not going to be a judgment that is a reward. It's a judgment of justice. It's a judgment that is condemnation into eternal hell. That's a hard word. But you know what? You have to teach it. Jesus, it's 
been told, I haven't done the exact study, but it's been told that Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven in, this, in the scriptures. Do you know why that is? <laughs> because to get the good news, you have to understand the bad news. You have to recognize that you're a sinner deserving hell, but God desires that you would be saved, amen? <laughs> He says, I want to give you grace. I don't want you to know justice in the sense of me pouring out judgment upon you. But those that reject it, they will realize that there is a judge. What blows my mind is when people go, who are you to judge me? Only God can judge me. You ever heard that? You're like, that's like getting hit with a light breeze from me versus getting ran over by a Mack truck by God. Only God can judge me. That's going to be way worse for you. I don't have the power to cast you into hell, but God does and he desires that you would be saved. Repent, believe in the gospel. It says in verse five, you've lived on this earth in pleasure and luxury. You fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. (laughs) Again, not a light word. But what this is saying is there are people that are living right now in luxury and comfort. And they say, that's so cute that you guys go to church on Sunday. That's so funny that you guys read some book that's thousands of years old and you think it's all mystical and fancy. I don't need that. I have all my things over here and I'm doing just fine. Do you realize that those things are corroding? (laughs) There's a corrosion. That word corrosion that was back in verse two and three has to do with the poison of a serpent. It's funny. You get bit by a venomous snake. You don't know immediately whether it was venomous or not (laughs) until the effects start coming in. And you're like, this is no good. (laughs) People are living right now in the last days, it would say in verse two and three, they're thinking, I'm heaping up all these things. I'm doing so great. He says, it's like you're in an offering of the Lord that's going to be offered on the day of slaughter. That's going to glorify God because as you've rejected him, there's going to come a day where judgment comes. Psalm 912 says, when he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Here's the reality. How do you avoid the vengeance of God that is coming upon sin and everything wrong? You must humble yourself and admit that A, you're a sinner and B, you need a savior. Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, the life, according to John 14, six. And it was proven at his baptism in Luke 3, 22. The voice of God says, you are my beloved son and you, I am well pleased. Then we're told that Jesus lived perfect according to the law, perfect according to the spirit, doing marvelous, miraculous things according to Acts 10, 38, just healing everyone, showing that God was with him. And then Jesus said in John 5, 24, if you hear my voice, obey the word, believe in the one who sent me, you will have everlasting life. You won't come into judgment, but you've passed from death into life. He says, I am the son of God. I am coming to give you the truth. You believe that truth. You will not go into judgment and eternal death. But men say, I don't need that. I'm good doing what I'm doing. And he says, man, that is going to be like preparing yourself for slaughter. And in verse six, James says, look at the perverse method of the greedy and the wicked. He says, you've condemned, you've murdered the just. He does not resist you. And see in this section, this verse, what it's literally talking about is that those that had riches, power, influence, they would take the poor and oppressed to the courtroom. This is what it's talking about. And they would actually bribe and influence the court to find it in their favor. Again, nothing like that happens anymore in 2024, right? (laughs) Isn't this wild? Doesn't matter who's in power. Doesn't matter what country you're in. Hearts of men are wicked. They greedily chased whatever they think will fulfill them and they're willing to take the just and they will use their power in a way to where the the poor, the oppressed, the innocent can't resist the judgments because they don't have the power to do so. And see, that can be so frustrating when you're brought into a situation like that where you're like, I did nothing wrong. (laughs) Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, it says in Matthew 5, 12, because your riches are in heaven, not on this earth. You might be absolutely just downtrodden, just beaten down this morning by the things of your circumstances in your workplace, at school. I don't know, there could be relational things in this room that are bearing down on you. Like, I did nothing wrong. The Lord sees and knows all things. Man, trust that the Lord has a purpose. Even in those seasons, we're like, man, people are getting away with injustice. 
Do you know, Jesus told a story, a parable, the parable of the wicked vine dressers in Matthew 21, 38. That's where these guys were hired to take care of the vineyard. And they begin to go, hey, if we just take over the vineyard ourselves and we possess it, we can get everything. We can get the riches, get it all. And the vineyard owner sends his son after sending multiple messengers. And they say, if we kill the son, we'll get the vineyard and we can keep everything in it. And Jesus proposes that question. He says, what do you think is going to happen to the vine dressers when that vineyard owner shows up after they've killed his son? We understand the parallel here, right? That people go, I want all the things, but I don't need Jesus Christ. This is a secondary application. The first application had to do with Israel rejecting and missing Jesus Christ. But let me apply it to you here in this room. If you say, look, I just want all the things, the blessings of God, but I don't need the son. There's going to be a judgment that comes from that. The vineyard owner is coming. He's going to avenge, repent, humble yourself, trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at the second section here of patience. It makes sense that we go into talking about uh, patience and persevering. Look at seven through nine. It says, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So James is giving us a call to if we're enduring suffering. And remember that early church, that early church was enduring much persecution, both from, from, from just outside people that thought they were crazy for believing in this one who died upon a cross, from their family as Jewish people that said, hey, he's our Messiah. We believe him. They say, you're crazy for this. You're, you're forsaking the things of our culture, of our past, of our history. And they say, no, these things, Jesus came and fulfilled these things. He's not here to destroy them, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17. But they would suffer persecution. And they're being told here, be patient until the coming of the Lord. The word patience, it has to do here. It's this word makrothumeo. It means enduring mistreatment and persevering through hardships specifically it says in this case with a long temper <laughs> a long fuse i don't know about you guys but sometimes i can have a short fuse <laughs> i'm like hey i can i can i have like two cheeks right you slap this one i'll turn this one but i don't have three cheeks i've heard that said before right third one i pop you right you're like no <laughs> how about forgive all these times this is how many times 70 times seven times and everyone's like are you crazy jesus you're just calling us to, to endure these things, to be patient. Notice what they're patient for. The coming of the Lord. This is not to be some soft doormat that says, oh, it's okay. As a Christian, I just lay here and get beat up and I have no hope. Our hope is in the fact that the Lord Jesus is going to make all things right in his time. There is nothing on this planet that will fix the chaos. You might think, let me be clear. <laughs> it's funny. I believe that there are better options than worse options that we should be voting for. There are people that we will say that makes a whole lot more sense as a believer. You guys know what I'm saying here, right? But I will tell you, I hope you don't think that they're going to bring perfect justice on this earth. Jesus Christ alone is who we're waiting for, for justice. Christ alone is our hope. It doesn't matter. We want our guys to win because we understand we want to stand for what's true, what preserves, what protects. Amen. And we use the Bible to decide what those things are that preserve and protect. Whoever aligns close to that, that's who we get behind. But let me be clear, that goes so far. At some point I go, my true hope is in Jesus Christ though. Christ is the one I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for him to come make this right. He's gonna rule perfectly as the king of kings and he's going to come in glory as Jesus said in Luke 21, 27. Are you excited for that day? <laughs> I hope you're excited for that. <laughs> If you're in here today and you're like, I don't want Jesus to come back. There's something wrong. <laughs> you haven't trusted in Jesus. He's our hope. If you see Jesus coming back as a curse, you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ yet. When you trust in Jesus, you go, man, everything is going to be made right when he returns. And it's funny because it says here that we need to wait for the coming of the Lord. And he says, see how patient the farmer is, right? As he waits for the fruit of the earth, he receives the early and the latter rain. He waits the whole cycle of the harvest season. It's funny, the farmer doesn't go out and put seed in the ground on Saturday. 
And then on Sunday, go, I didn't grow. I better dig it up and throw it away. We get so impatient serving the Lord. Lord, I, I put this thing in here two months ago. It should already have come to fruition. No, it's up to the Lord. <laughs> You're called to plant the thing, to water the thing, to be faithful in the thing until the Lord brings the increase, until the Lord brings the result, until the Lord brings the justice, the right, the uprightness. <laughs> and we get so impatient, but it's interesting. People on the outside, they read these verses, go, are you guys serious? You're waiting for the coming of the Lord? This dude was writing about it 2,000 years ago. You're still waiting for that? Yes. <laughs> well, is, doesn't that make you like a little bothered that he hasn't come yet? No, you know why? We're 2,000 years closer to the Lord returning. <laughs> that doesn't alarm me that he hasn't come yet. That is the grace and long suffering of God that he has not shown up yet. You say, how do we know that? 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. Do you realize that with every day, with every week, with every month that the Lord has waited to come back, more people have come to know him. Fewer people now will go into that judgment of condemnation because they had time to repent and trust in the grace of God. I'm not upset that the Lord has waited. There are days when I go, okay, Lord, you could come back right now. That would be good, right? <laughs> but if the Lord doesn't come back, I have to trust. I need to be patient. I need to wait for him, wait upon him. And we're told in verse eight, how do you do this? Be patient by establishing your hearts because the coming of the Lord is at hand. That word establish, it means to strengthen. It has to do with the fact that we need to be stabilized, <laughs> Do you know when you get unstable, it's because you've moved away from the word of God, right? Think about it in your life. As husbands, as dads, as wives, as daughters, as sons, whatever. When you start acting out of character as a believer, it's because you've transgressed or moved away from the word of God. But if you stabilize yourself, you strengthen yourself and study the word and praise the Lord. You guys are here on Sunday morning getting verse by verse, some heavy stuff this morning. But I pray that you guys would go out every day Every morning, begin your day with the Lord. Commit your day to him. Be listening to the word of God. Be studying it. And man, establish your hearts in it. Because man, when you go through hard things, you need the word of God to remember that he's coming back. <laughs> this is what we're waiting for, his return. And let me be clear, I get to hit this every so often. And I'm always excited to do it because I love talking about this. I believe in a pre-trib rapture of the church. I believe that is what is taught in scripture. It doesn't violate the character of God. It doesn't violate scripture. And we see Old Testament pictures like Enoch in Genesis 5, 24, who walked with God and was not because God took him. Hebrews 11 says that that man didn't taste death. An Old Testament picture of a rapture. We know it's in the Bible. <laughs> we know the principles in the New Testament. Where do you place it? I believe that Revelation lays it out very clear. We are as the bride are waiting to be called up to be with the Lord. And when we're with him, it's going to be awesome. We are going to be with him. And then we're told in Revelation 19, he comes back with his saints. We're going to come back. First Corinthians 6, 2 says we rule and reign with him. We're not God, but we're committed to these spots where the Lord allows us in glorification to judge and rule with him as his people. Why are we getting so upset about these temporal things? Again, I'm not calling you to weakness. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I'm calling you to meekness to know that there are times when you have the power to pop someone in the mouth because you don't like what they said. <laughs> but in meekness, you say, you know what? I can call on the Lord and I can recall his word and I know that he's going to make things right. I'm going to do everything in my power as the Lord leads me to stand for truth. We aren't called to walk away from truth. Amen. We stand for truth, but when men reject it, when policies reject it, when injustice is happening in spite of the truth we're standing for we have to realize that the lord is going to come back and make things right even if no one receives our message here on this side of eternity the lord's going to make things right be patient and wait for him it says in verse 9 don't grumble against one another <laughs> it seems almost out of place here when you're like grumbling why is this being mentioned think about what you do when things start to go wrong <laughs> Don't you tend to, even if you don't, you're tempted to just take it out on everyone around you. Just be in a bad mood, talk poorly about everyone else around you. 
and just grumble. The word here is stenazo. It means to sigh or to groan, to murmur against your brethren. And it happens so much more easily when you're in seasons of persecution, oppression, or trials or injustice. Does it not? See, when everything's good, it's pretty easy to be a good Christian, I think. (laughs) When it's like, dude, I'm sitting in Sunday morning service with the freedom to meet like this, to talk about these things. This is easy. I can do this. But now when you go back to work tomorrow and someone's spreading lies about you and talking poorly about you and not respecting you and the work that you're doing, that can be very difficult. And you get discouraged because you're not established in the word of God, potentially, as verse eight said. Then you start to not be established in the word and you start to actually say things that you never should be saying as a believer. You start to grumble against everyone else around you and you start pointing fingers at everyone else. This is his fault, her fault, their fault. And then it says, don't do that. It says, why shouldn't you do that? Because the judge is standing at the door. Has anyone ever told you, hey, would you want to be doing that if Jesus showed up right now? You ever heard that saying? (laughs) I remember hearing that for the first time. I heard that was more of a Southern saying, actually, like you don't want to be doing that if Jesus showed up right now. That's just a Bible belt thing, I guess. Even though not everyone knows Jesus, they use Jesus as a threat in people's life, right? (laughs) It's funny. And so in this case, it says, man, why shouldn't you be grumbling? Because the judge, remember, Jesus said in John 5, 22, he said, the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. And if someone doesn't honor the son, they don't honor the father who sent him. We hear the judge and we think God, the father, right? Jesus Christ is going to return and act as the judge. And we, as people, first of all, he's going to call us home. We want to be prepared that the judge is prepping to hold court. I don't want to be condemning myself with crazy things that I'm saying. I want to be established in the word, patiently waiting for his return. And I will tell you, I believe that the imminent return of Jesus is closer than ever. And you say, how can you not? It's a fact. (laughs) He's coming back at some time every day. We're closer. Amen. (laughs) Not naming a day, not naming an hour, but you look around and you're like, dude, where do we go from here? It looks really biblical outside right now. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of things happening around us. We're like, that's Revelation 6 right there. It kind of looks like, I don't know. We're setting the stage. I'm not saying we're in the tribulation. Let me be clear. (laughs) But you can see that, man, the things are set. The next thing, according to scripture, is that the church going home. (laughs) Are we living like that today? Are we ready for it? Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, 1 Peter 4, 9 says. Man, that we would be a church, a bride, that would be without stain, without blemish. And when the bridegroom comes, it's like, man, we're ready for that wedding. We're ready for that wedding feast. It's going to be an awesome marriage supper of the lamb, Revelation 19 type stuff. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says here, let me find where I'm at here. Give me a second. I have tons of writing in my Bible. Here we go. Verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So in verse 10, again, James, knowing he has many of these Jewish believers, they know the scriptures. He says, consider the prophets that spoke in the name of the Lord and think about how they're an example of suffering and patience. How many times people pray for things like, I wish I had a ministry like Elijah. Oh man, to have fire coming down from heaven, right? Holding back rain. That would be so cool. Such a powerful ministry. Elijah in chapter 19 of 1 Kings is like, God, I want to die. (laughs) This is just awful. (laughs) I don't know what's happening. No one's responding. When there is response, they go back into apostasy. They're just terrible. Everything, Lord, take me now. And I love it. The Lord's like, you need to sleep a little bit. You need to eat a little something. You need to calm down. Because I still have plans for you, right? (laughs) And it's so funny, we get so anxious. And I will tell you, this is funny. Elijah, side note. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. All right, we're good. Side note. (laughs) Elijah said, Lord, I wish I could just die. Do you know what he was running from in that chapter? Someone was trying to kill him. That makes no sense, Elijah. Just stay there and die if you're serious. You're just kind of being dramatic right now. (laughs) You're just panicked. (laughs) And then secondly, do you know what happened to Elijah at the end of his life? He never died. (laughs) He got taken into heaven in a chariot of fire. He was worried about something that was never going to affect him. That blows my mind sometimes. (laughs) The things I worry about, and the Lord's like, oh my gosh, eat some cake and 
sleep a little bit, dude. Like, this is what he did. He actually says he baked a cake, right? Not like birthday cake, but you know what I mean? He took care of Elijah. But you go through all the prophets. You go through people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, all these different people, and Jesus himself. They brought the very word of God that was absolutely true, backed up with signs and wonders, and the people still rejected it. Have you ever thought, man, I just, if I just do this thing, that'll convince this person. Man, they need to humble themselves. The Lord has given everything they need to trust in him. But you continue to water, continue to speak, but understand you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to suffer sometimes. And see, it says in Hebrews 11, 37, 38 of such faithful prophets, it says they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, uncomfortable materials, they were destitutely, uh, or I'm sorry, destitute and afflicted, they were tormented, but the world was not worthy of them. <laughs> we walk around, look at our circumstances, we're like, where's God? The world's not worthy. <laughs> of the thing that you're proclaiming as they reject it. The world is not worthy of that faithfulness of the one that says, I'm going to stand with Jesus no matter what. And he brings up Job in verse 11, the epitome, the poster boy of suffering in the Bible, right? Job. Who here wants to live the ministry of Job? That's right. You better keep your hand down. You don't want that, right? We're like, Job, that was hard. Let's remember. Job began a good man who loved the Lord. And Satan shows up and he's like, you know what? I bet I could get that guy to curse you. And the Lord says, look it, just don't kill him. <laughs> That's funny. The Lord put parameters on what the enemy was allowed to do. That's compassion to say, I can't let you kill him. Because you know what Satan would have done if he could? He would have killed him. <laughs> God says, you can't kill him. And then he goes out and man, Job loses his job, his family, his health. His wife's telling him to curse the Lord. His friends are a bunch of maniacs, it turns out. And they're telling him bad advice. They're giving him bad things. But at the end of the story, do you know what it says in Job 42.2? Job says, I now, going through all these things, I now know that no one can remove from your hand the things that you have planned to do. You're in sovereign control. I was good and I was blessed over here. But after the trial, I am better and I am even more blessed. People go, but he lost his kids. Not in eternity. <laughs> He's going to be with all of them. And he gets kids back in physical state in that eternal thing. Everything is blessed. But man, it didn't look like it. It did not feel like it as Job was going through the trial. Can I remind you that Job did not have the book of Job to read while he went through it? <laughs> Think about it. He doesn't know why he's going through. We're like, oh, that's just Satan tormenting him, right? Messing with him. He didn't know that. His, his friends are telling him things like, dude, you must have really messed up and you must be a really bad sinner. God hates you. Incorrect. God loves you. He is compassionate towards you. He's protecting you through that. And again, Matthew 5.10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I hope that if we're suffering, <laughs> I don't know of a better word here, so forgive me. If we're suffering because we're jerks, <laughs> that's your fault. <laughs> Are you suffering for righteousness sake? Man, you're called to do that. I hope we know the balance as the church. <laughs> there are times when we go out and we purposely make enemies. We're like, oh, we're so persecuted for Jesus. Dude, you earn that. <laughs> you ask for that. There are times when the Lord calls you to stand in hard things. And you say, man, I wouldn't even sign up for this. But because the Lord's calling me to this, I'm going to go stand for righteousness. And you suffer for righteousness sake. That is unto the Lord. Amen. Know the difference. <laughs> It's taken time for me sometimes. I sometimes think every fight is my fight. The Lord says, sometimes I'm calling you to pray because it's that person's fight over there. But there are times the Lord says, no, this is your fight. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Amen, amen. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 12. It says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. This was important because in their culture, they would actually swear by things like the temple. <laughs> they would swear by heaven. They wouldn't swear by God as Jews because they felt like that was a little too much. But they would swear by different things to help get integrity or I, I guess present themselves to have integrity, to get some credence to their claims. 
And what this is saying here, again, it seems disjointed, but when you start to remember, we're talking about suffering and having to be patient. We often are tempted to run from the thing that the Lord says, hey, I called you to this. Stand in it. Let your yes be yes. If I haven't called you to that, that's fine. Pray for those that have been called to it. Let your no be no in these things. But stand and have integrity. And see, in their culture, they would swear by things. And certain there were loopholes in the way they would swear over things. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 5, 33 to 37, when he said the very same thing. Let your yes be yes, your no, no. For whatever is more than this is from the evil one. In other words, I hope that you guys know this. If I told you, hey, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, that you guys would go, cool, I trust James because he's had a track record, hopefully, of telling us the truth. (laughs) But now if I had to tell you, hey, man, I swear on like my grandma's grave. You ever hear people do things like that? You're like, bro, you must be a really terrible liar that no one will believe you unless you like invoke the dead somehow, right? That's awful. (laughs) People would say, you can believe me. I'm going to swear by the the temple. I'm going to swear to God. You ever hear people say that? Just say what you mean and do it. Have some integrity, even if you're in the battle, even if you're in the storm, especially when you're in the trial and the storm, because people are watching. When you go through the hard things as a believer, do you know that's when people are paying attention? It's so easy for us to proclaim the name of Jesus while we're on the mountaintop. And people are like, cool, I can celebrate too when I'm going through good things. How do you do when you suffer? Am I still letting my SBS that I trust in Jesus? Am I still walking saying, no, I'm not going to trust in the things of the world. I trust in the Lord and I believe this is the call of every man. This is the right thing to do as Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says. It is the, the purpose of man to fear God and to keep his commandments, to revere him, to walk in his things, even if it's through suffering. And see, it's wild because how do we get through these things? I think we need to be called to pray. Look at verse 13 through 16. It says, is anyone among you suffering? let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. An incredible section about prayer because it begins in verse 13. It says, here's how we are to pray fervently. If you're suffering, man, don't start cursing the Lord. Start seeking the Lord. (laughs) Start praying for his hand to guide you, to direct you. If you're in a season of just blessing, for lack of a better word, you celebrate, glorify the Lord by praying through worship of sorts. You know, as we gather and worship here, we're singing unto the Lord, right? I think people come in sometimes, maybe not at our church, but I've seen this. It's like, oh, I'm going to miss that half hour of like karaoke time where we sing along with the words on the screen. That's weird. It's like, you're coming in here. You're preparing your heart to receive the word. But in that time, you are to be worshiping the Lord. The things that you're saying, the things that you're meditating on, it's essentially a form of prayer where you're celebrating who God is. And as you come in, you might be suffering, seek the Lord. If you're celebrating, glorify the Lord. (laughs) And see, it's interesting because in verse 14, it says, anyone among you sick, uses this word for sick, astheneo, it means feeble or weak. And so the first application has to do with physical affirmities. We see the same word is used in Mark 6.56 and John 4.46 to speak of physical ailments. But the same word is also used for spiritual weaknesses, in Romans 14, 1, and 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 12. And he says, if you're suffering, whether it be of spiritual things or of physical things, come to the elders of the church, which people have laughed at me because they're like, dude, you're 30 years younger than me. That's not what elder means. Elder is the appointed leaders of the church, amen? Our leadership team, we walk around, we carry these little, I have it, this little flask of oil. <laughs> I carry this everywhere I go. So when I'm at Costco, I remember I'm a pastor and act accordingly, right? So when people cut me off for the samples, I don't lose my mind. I can feel the oil in my pocket, right? I carry it everywhere. It anchors me to remind me who I am, okay? I don't know. But I carry it because we believe that it it resembles, it represents the Holy Spirit. And we're told in this verse, if someone's sick, come pray for them, anoint them with oil. 
Now, I don't pour the whole jar over you. And we've seen things like this. I'll just, I'll just get a thumb full of it, put it on your head, and we'll pray for you. And now some people read this and they go, well, the Lord will heal you, period. You just don't have enough faith if you didn't get healed. You have to be careful with these statements. We were just told in James 4, if the Lord wills, we pray for his will. Amen? Now, I have been in the room, I have been in a place where we pray with oil, and I have literally in the moment seen people be healed of their physical afflictions right there. There have been other times where we anointed, we prayed, and the Lord healed that person in eternity. Took them home. And what am I supposed to say? Oh, I didn't have enough faith, or you didn't have enough faith, that must have been it. Talk to Paul, who prayed in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, Lord, take this thorn of my flesh from me. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul didn't know that there was a prayer he could have prayed to be healed of that thorn of the flesh. <laughs> Jesus, who prayed for any other way but to die upon that cross, is there any other way? The Father says, my will is for you to die upon that cross. <laughs> you have to. Sometimes, we have to understand the Lord is ready to heal. He's always able, but it has to be according to his will, according to what he wants to do. And in this section, it's interesting because in verse 15 and verse 16, it starts talking about the prayer of faith will save the sick. It has to do with faith, spiritual things. <laughs> and it says things like in verse 16, confess your, con your tres trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Now we're talking about trespasses, needing forgiveness. That doesn't sound like physical ailment type stuff. You see, this is talking about, first of all, absolutely come and get anointed with oil. We believe the Lord can and will heal according to his will. Amen? But sometimes we don't run to prayer when we have all these relational issues that are dividing us spiritually, that are harming our church body. Like, I don't need prayer for that. I don't need to come to the elders. I don't need to pray for anyone. I don't need to be with anyone. Man, when you come and you confess your sins to someone... Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, if your brother has something against you, it's not just when you have something against him. That's Matthew 18 stuff. Matthew 5 says, if you know that someone has something against you, whether it's right or not, you need to go set your gift down before you come to the altar. Go pray with them. Go confess those things. And man, that restoration, spiritually, it's going to be made whole again. Amen. We're so quick to get prayer for physical things, but we'll walk around just, just with this bitterness, division, sinful behavior of the church. Are we praying together? Are we confessing our shortcomings to one another that we've done to one another? He says, man, if you're going through trials, you're going to start saying grumbling things about each other. <laughs> it's going to cause division. You guys need to pray about those things. You need to get right again. Come and be restored. Come back into fellowship with the Lord first and foremost, but with your brother and sister in the Lord. Amen? I'll tell you this morning. <laughs> if there's division in this room and you're like, I don't like this person across the room, I will tell you, you need to pray about that. That should not be normal behavior walking into the church. Sadly, we've made it normal. One of my pastors used to say, hey, heaven's a big place. We just, we don't have to hang out in heaven, so it's fine. No! <laughs> Don't do that. I get what he's saying. That's why I won't mention his name. I don't want to knock him. But how about we just solve those things by confessing our sins to each other and asking for forgiveness? And then we can actually enjoy the presence of each other, both here and in eternity. Amen? Man, that we would walk according to the things that the Lord calls us to. Fervent prayer, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It can fix so many things, whether they be physical, spiritual, relational, whatever they are, we got to come to the Lord. And look at the example that James gives in verse 17 and 18. We're almost done. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years, three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. <laughs> I don't know. You ever think that prayer is like a small thing, like a small tool? Maybe the final instrument, if nothing else has worked, it's the last resort. <laughs> Elijah shows up on the scene suddenly. I think it's late 1 Kings 16 or right at 1 Kings 17. And he shows up and King Ahab is in power. King Ahab is described as being the worst king that had ever been king of Israel up until that time. Do you know some of the kings that were before him? <laughs> they were bad dudes. Ahab shows up and God says, yep, that guy's the worst. <laughs> Elijah, you get to minister. Well, that guy's in power. And his wife, Jezebel, 
Yeah, that's it. I don't meet a lot of people named Jezebel. Apologize if that's your name, but you don't get that because people like Jezebel, that represents a really wicked woman in scripture. Ahab and Jezebel are in power. Elijah shows up and he's called by the Lord as the Lord willed to heal, like seal up the heavens. Now, Elijah, we're told, had a nature like ours. Do you know what that means? He had the same kind of fears. <laughs> he had the same kind of doubts. He had the same kind of physical makeup. He was not some demigod. He was a man. We just talked about it. A couple chapters later, he's wanting to die. He's so fearful. But at this point, he comes out with prayer according to the will of God and says, you know what? To get the attention of these people who worship Baal, the sky god, who brings them rain supposedly for their crops in this agricultural society, I'm going to pray in my God's name that he closes the heavens for three and a half years. <laughs> and you know what happened? The weather changed because of his prayer for three and a half years. Like we read that and we're like, this can't be serious, right? Do you know that Jesus cited this as being true in Luke 4, 25? He said, I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three and a half years. <laughs> People always go, you really believe in Adam and Eve? Yes, Jesus talked about them. You believe Jonah got swallowed by a well? Yes, Jesus said that truly happened. You believe that a guy can pray and the heavens would stop? If it's the Lord's will, yes, because Jesus said it happened, amen? Prayer is a powerful thing. <laughs> he prayed and you say, why did he heal up or seal up the skies? So that the people that were trusting in their riches would get shaken and woken up when the rain wasn't coming to give them the crops they needed. They were trusting in all of these stupid earthly things. And Elijah says, you are Israel. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be governed by God. And so they, he seals up the skies and he comes back and he gives them a challenge at Mount Carmel and says, let's find out who the real God is. The Baal prophets can come and set up their sacrifice. We'll see if their God answers. Spoiler alert, he doesn't. And he says, and I'll set it up and my God will answer. I will soak this thing with water and he'll still totally just absorb this whole sacrifice by fire. And we're told specifically in 1 Kings 18, 39, when the God, when, when the God of Israel, God of the universe, he just fire from heaven absorbs that sacrifice. It says in 1 Kings 18, 39, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Amen. They needed their cage to get rattled. <laughs> they needed to be broken. They needed to be in a place of desperation. Desperation is the beginning of worship. And Elijah came with the word of truth. And for three and a half years, the dude's living by a river, getting fed by dirty birds, right? Like unclean animals are feeding him. And he's getting taken care of by a Gentile widow. He's suffering hard things, but the Lord brought it to fruition for his glory in his timing. And he answered the prayers of Elijah that aligned with his will. Amen? Look at how we end this whole book here, 19 through 20. It says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I think it's cool how the book of James ends. It doesn't end with like, a, and so-and-so greets you and this and that. It just ends suddenly but I think it might, I, I, I'm careful to do this, but I think it might be the, one of the most important notes in this entire epistle. Because right off the bat, he says, brethren. So who's he writing to? He's writing to believers. He says, my brethren, if anyone among you in the church that believes, if they wander, this uses this word planao, it means to be led aside from the path of virtue or to go astray. He says, if someone starts to stray and wanders from in the church, they're going back to the things of the world. They're going to these things they shouldn't be. He says, man, you need to come and you need to turn him back. And he who turns such a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death. Man, are you so comfortable this morning? You say, listen, I said a prayer 13 years ago on some baseball field at a revival I'm good forever. I don't have to do any of these things. What's the big deal? Man, I will tell you, you are missing out on the blessed fellowship that the Lord desires for you to have, first of all. Come all the way in, amen? No more lip service Christianity. The judge is at the door. <laughs> Let's live with integrity and passion and zeal for the word of God. 
I think nothing upsets me more than when a pastor gets in the pulpit and he's bored with the word of God. Some of you might be really annoyed at how fast I speak, how loud I get sometimes. I am so excited because I think the time is short. I would, let's just do another service right now. I'm just kidding. I want to keep going. <laughs> you guys are like, I want to get to Texas Roadhouse. That's cool. We're almost done. Okay, I'm serious. But the reality is <laughs> we need to be called to man to stay in this and we need to be ready to call each other back into the truth. Why are we searching for the proverbial fence of how far can I go and still be a believer? Stop. Come on back. Amen. Why are we so afraid to draw one another back into the truth when we see one another straying? That's a work of the enemy. The world's not going to tell them to repent. We need to tell them to come back in. And don't read this as a commission, as the great commission call. That's not what this says. This is not go out into the world and make disciples. This is your brethren who are among you when they wander. We have a propensity in our flesh to go back to the things of the world, to trust in things, to seek in things we should not be trusting and seeking in. May we call each other to truth. And I will give one last note on this. It's not just in this church. People go, why are you so adamant about calling out things that you see at other churches that are wickedness? Because they're professing to believe, to, to be followers and believers of Jesus Christ. How can I stand here and watch a church in our city host a drag queen hour and say they're believers of Jesus Christ? Yes, I said it. Sorry. <laughs> Take a step back. Sorry. Calm down. Here's the thing. <laughs> I know. I'm like, don't calm down. Amen. All right. These are the kinds of things Jesus tips tables for. We said there's a time and place to tip tables. <laughs> I'm not calling you for, for a riot. Hear this out. There are churches in our city that are hosting Easter services that are going to tell people they're totally fine in their sin. And as a matter of fact, God celebrates it. That breaks my heart. That makes me angrier than anything any politician could ever say because those people say they believe Jesus and they're the church. God forbid we don't correct statements like that. We will call that out every single time we see it. <laughs> the church has gone cold in these things. Who am I to judge them? Don't judge. No, you judge according to scripture. You stand for truth as the Lord calls the truth. Let your yes be yes, your no, no. And I will tell you, the time is near. The Lord is coming soon, sooner than later. Amen. <laughs> I believe that time is very short. We should be ready, man, that the Lord would do a great revival before his return. I believe we have a great opportunity in this city of McKinney <laughs> where, man, the Lord wants to do a fresh new work. We already see it. Amen. Man, be ready. Be filled with the spirit. Be established in the word of God. Celebrate him wherever you go. Why don't you guys stand me? We'll, we'll pray.